Hello everyone, welcome to the Budget Forum. My name is Alyssa Maharm, Vice President of College Services, and with me... It's Jeff Schaefer, Dean of Business Services. And we're going to walk through kind of the budget and the forecast and um, give you guys plenty of time to ask any questions you might have. I encourage you to ask questions throughout. Don't feel like you have to wait until we're done and then ask questions if there's a slide up and you're not sure what it means or you have a follow-up question. Feel free to kind of chime in right in the moment. And um, so the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to talk about the budget process and where we've been until now. And then Jeff will get into a little bit more of the details. And um, so we should get through this in about 30 minutes or less. We'll see. All right, so this is the budget calendar that um, highlights some of the things that we've done so far this year and where we're at now. So here we are, you know, just about in June of 2019. This is kind of hard to read. Um, the pointer here, but we've had a lot of shared governance meetings. We've done a lot of work with the budget advisory group, and it's been kind of a unique year this year because we've had this really long delay on getting an understanding about state funding and what that number is going to be. So it's been challenging to kind of put the forecast together and the budget together, not really knowing what the state's going to be allocating for um, all community colleges in Oregon. So it's, we've been in this weird place where things have been delayed. So we're trying to um, kind of hold out for that last number that we should be getting. Rumor is that it'll be this week, so the end of this week we should know our community college support fund number. Uh, as you know, tuition and fees were set by the board in April, and so that went through, and there was a lot of deliberation with the board of the tuition and fees reading and what that should be in the impacts to students. And then our budget committee meetings occurred in May. We had two of those, and so then our next step is budget adoption the end of June. So June 25th is when the board actually will adopt the budget. So really we are going down to the wire, uh, getting these final decisions made on the budget allocation. So budget principles. Each year when we go through the budget process, we circle back with our board and we find out, are the budget principles that we used last year still relevant? Do we need to make any changes to them? This year we had a very slight change to one of them, but I'll talk through all of them real quickly. So the first one, and these are in no particular order, basically says we have strategic priorities and theme, major themes, and we're trying to work towards those. So to what degree does our budget support funding those efforts? And how are we being strategic with our funding allocation? The second one talks about median income and being aware of the affordability factor within our district. And one thing to point out, our district is very diverse. And we have about a $30,000 spread between the high and the low in median income. So that's really difficult to balance, right? And we're, we're considered this metro size college, yet we have a lot of really rural areas. So there's always a challenge with income. And then the third bullet down, focusing on one-time funding, fiscal responsibility, and return on investment. What we want to try to do is not overcommit the long-term budget for the college. So the more that you include a bunch of ongoing requests, that's going to compound year after year. So we really have to be careful. What's a one-time request? you know, in demand on resources versus a long-term ongoing. And then also looking at return on investment. So if you invest some money, are you going to get a good return back? And we do have a team working right now on revenue generation, and we're trying to explore ideas that could bring money back to the college, whether it's through additional enrollment, additional FTE, um, but it maybe needs a little bit of seed money. So sometimes you have to spend a little money to get money. And so if we can put some seed money into some strategic areas, can we get a return on that investment? So we're always looking at that. And um, kind of the bottom line of that third bullet, looking at the three-year three horizon. So we try to balance the forecast over three years, which is challenging because we don't always know what that third year is going to look like. You know, we're doing this biennium budgeting. And so um, we do a three-year look, and um, we're supposed to be balanced when we submit our budget in June. So that's one of our goals. And then lastly, this 10% minimum. So we have a 10% minimum of resources that we must maintain in the budget. It's a set aside that has to be in there. And the board has approved that policy. And so that's always something that we're using in the forecast when we're projecting forward. What does our minimum ending fund balance need to be from year to year? And that kind of comes off the top. And, um, and then we all we are looking at a five-year horizon. So it yeah, says five years here at the bottom. So even though we have to balance the three-year, we're always looking five years out because you never know what's around the curve. And when we look at things that really impact our budget a lot, like PERS, we really do need to look five years out because there are a lot of projections out there that show what those rates are going to be multiple years into the future. And so if we ignore that, then that doesn't make sense. So we always want to, yeah. Um, 
when I talk to my uh, other directors around the other 16 SBDCs, uh, I don't think all the colleges do that 10% reserve, do they? I mean, some of them it's, are in pretty a, tough times. They're, like correct. There's some that are around 8, some are 10. The average is 10, and 10% is kind of the best practice and um, GFOA, Government Finance Officers Association, and GAP, there's different rules out there in the financial realm that kind of guide our work, and really 10% is what is fiscally responsible. I know that some colleges have dipped into that because they're just in this dire condition and they're trying to buy time. Um, we are actually fortunate because we have, in good times, put aside some money, like for PERS reserves, and so while other community colleges in Oregon have been cutting this year, we actually didn't have to cut. And that's pretty unique. Most colleges in Oregon um, were cutting this year, millions and millions of dollars in some cases. So, so we, in good times, while the, although we were lean staffing-wise, we were able to put some money aside for reserves. But we have maintained that 10%. The question about changing the 10% has come up. It actually came up this year in one of the board meetings when we were talking about the budget and the forecast. So they do think about it. I think there's enough people on the board that have not been ready or willing to go there. So um, so it's still at 10%. So looking into our budget development process, I don't know if you all are familiar with this form, but we have um, assessment that we needed to do for accreditation. And then from that, we have unit plans that groups develop. They set their goals, they identify outcomes, they look at gaps. And so what this form does is it allows them to turn the gaps into potential budget requests to help bridge that gap. Challenge is that with a tight budget, you may identify a gap and a way to fill it, and then we just don't have the funding to get there. So I understand that can be frustrating. But this form and its purpose is to you know, have a space to put the request. How do you describe that request, and how does it link to our strategic priorities and what we're trying to accomplish at the college? How much is it? Is it one time or ongoing? And then the category of the request. So this could be personnel, materials and services, capital. It could be any number of things. So this is the form that we typically see every year. And then the budget advisory group gets together during the process and they talk about all the requests. And in this slide, you can see on the wall, there's a number of posters with post-it notes on it. And that's because people have a chance to go around the room, look at the requests, write notes about what does this mean? Could you do this instead? And ask key questions and kind of push on the different budget requests. And then in that room, we try to respond to them whether it's the person who submitted it or somebody who oversees that department, we try to clarify those budget requests during the budget advisory group meetings. And about two years ago, we instituted a process using Pull Everywhere where we could look at the different budget requests with the budget advisory group and folks could anonymously provide input to us and help us kind of rank those budget requests. So, you just use a device, I don't know if you're familiar with Pull Everywhere, you can use a laptop, an iPad, a cell phone, smartphone. And so we would have folks um, on the fly in the moment um, look at the requests. Of course, they would have the materials ahead of time to review, and then they would give it a, a score on their phone. And so there are two areas that we had them look at. And the first area was clear linkage to assessment. So this is really key. And when the accreditors came to the last visit and looked at CCC, they actually said that we're doing an amazing job of of doing that integrated budget planning and assessment process. So they really liked that we were very intentionally asking questions about assessment. And so in a nutshell, what's that, what that's saying is, do you have good data to support what you're doing? So one example of that might be that um, we are adding a bunch of buildings and there's an industry standard out there about what kind of custodial staff you need to support that many buildings or that much square footage in a building. So did the originator of a budget request look at data and use that data to kind of show the need for whatever they're asking for? This one in particular has to do with marketing and creative services. So it's not a request for a position, but it's a position for strategic marketing efforts. And this one had 64% of the respondents say that the department clearly linked program assessment data. 28% said somewhat, and 8% said no. So for each budget request, we asked those questions. And then after we asked them about this, there was an opportunity for people to ask questions through their device anonymously about the request. So somebody could have typed on the screen, do 
why are we doing this? You know, shouldn't we do this instead? Or would, you know, so there's other, other questions people could ask in the moment, and it was anonymous. And then um, we also, so the top one basically shows a summary of the last slide about assessment linkage. The bottom one talks about operational priority. So I mentioned there are two things. So first, assessment. Second, operational priority. So we wanted to find out what did the budget advisory group feel about operational priority and where did this fit into the mix? And so with marketing creative services, coincidentally, it ended up 64% urgent. And if, for those of you who can't read it, it says, operationally, this is an urgent priority. The college will be compromised if this is not funded by next fiscal year. So 64% said that. 28% said high, which is operationally, this is a high priority, although not critically urgent. The college will be disadvantaged if some way this is not funded by next fiscal year. So for each budget request, we have this data, and then afterwards, Jeff could pull together in kind of a ranked list, and it was very informative for all of our conversations about the budget. Any question. questions? Yeah. Uh, how, did, how does the uh, budget advisory group deal with um, stuff that's like common practice? I, I'll give you an example. I get questions all the time. Why do we buy computers from Dell when they're three times more expensive than other computers? And I, I, I have no idea. You know, and then there's issues like, well, we have an agreement with Office Max, Office Depot, are we really getting a good deal when we look at comparable products like on Amazon or mm -hmm. something like that? Um, so we do have, we do empower our managers to, to tack onto statewide pricing agreements. So the hope is that whatever agreement we have through the state for Dell or for supplies or whatever it may be is probably going to be better than if we just went out on our own because of the economy of scale. So. Um, it's hard to answer each of your questions like directly because you know I'm not doing the comparison, but we have a chief technology officer and a team who look at that and they're very budget fiscally conscious and they're like looking for this stuff and wanting to make sure that you know they're not overexpending um, our public resources. So it's kind of a hard question to answer without you know seeing the details, but we do tack on to statewide pricing agreements which are negotiated um, by the state who has a lot of purchasing power. Um, I'm trying to think, do you have any? Well, I would say the way the bag is um, integrated with that is there's a lot of empowerment up front to how you do your business, but there may be, um, especially when there's times of reduction. So if we, um, let's just say marketing, for example, has a way that they print 10,000 catalogs and mail them all, but then there becomes this, hey, why don't we do a different way to save um, $50,000? That's the type of thing that sometimes would go through a, the budget advisory group to say, this is our idea to reduce, um, to, to have savings at the, through a budget reduction, at which point, now if we're going to do something different than we're currently doing it, and there's going to be a reduction in service, um, and then on the other side, it goes the other way. You want to ask, ask for more money to do a, an added service. Those are the types of things. So adding or taking away from your current service levels that you're providing tend to be where the budget advisory groups come in. Everything else is more about how you run your own business. and. Um, at policy level. Yeah, it's possible that a lot of those examples that you provided wouldn't ever go through the budget advisory group or they may not be part of that conversation. Um, it might be handled in a different way. I know that with the revenue, genera revenue generation group that we have right now, we're also going to be doing something that's looking on the expense side and looking at kind of efficiency. So it's possible something like that could come up during those conversations about how could we do business smarter um, so I would expect ideas like that maybe to come forward for us to, you know, look into. Or maybe it comes through the innovation, you know, fund is an innovative idea. All right. All right so any other questions before Jeff moves on? Yeah. Is there a fund, though, that is specifically about technology? There is a technology process that is yeah. specifically about yeah. technology through there, ITAC and other. Yeah, yeah I mean, to, to so that I point, think, the Dell example does have a lot more eyes on those, those groups, yeah. different areas. I was trying to link the bag and how a, a budget advisory group would link to that particular example. But it probably well, I, know, I know I get the question, and I don't even know who to go to to even ask. Yeah. yeah. Well, so on, on technology, I would go to Dion Baird. For sure, if you have questions about that, or you can redirect them to Dion, um, or you, or me, you know, since it's it's under you know my umbrella, I'm happy to help kind of chase that down if people have ideas. 
I always want to hear from folks if they have an idea about what about this. I, I am all ears. So if somebody has a great idea and they want to pass it on to me, I'm happy to take it on and see if it's something worth exploring. But as Amanda said, we do have the Information Technology Oversight Committee. Um, we have the Ernst Group that deals with educational resources in the classroom. Um, we have DIG, Data Integrity Group. And so we do have kind of a governance structure around technology in particular that has cross-representation so that we try to you know, explore different ideas. Well, I, I know it's come up before when we wanted to upgrade classrooms, and so we're lucky here because we have good facilities. Yeah. You know, we've been through the process. So. And we just did a kind of campus-wide over at Oregon City look at all the classrooms, and we came up with a pretty thick document that has pages and pages of feedback from full-time and part-time faculty about individual classrooms and technology needs and facilities needs and you know accessibility and different things, and so. We're taking that and prioritizing it and figuring out how can we address some of the, some of the concerns that are going on in the classrooms. So we will we'll take input in lots of different ways. Yeah. All right, so Jeff's going to go right. through budget and forecast now. So I'm starting with a new slide here to help show the three-legged stool of funding. So instead of a graph for this one, you get to see visual representation. So um, as a community college, we're primarily funded by three revenue sources. So when you think of that as the three-legged stool that you always want to have your three um, funding sources, which one is um, property taxes for 20 million a year annually, or at least the current year. Uh, state funding is around 17 million and tuition is around 16 million. So those three, uh, it's in a good spot to actually have three stable um, or at least uh, well-rounded funding sources. Um, but what happens is, is you push forward into the next fiscal year, and suddenly you have increased costs. So this is like next fiscal year. You have increased PERS costs that go up, and other um, costs that go up. And suddenly you're out of balance if only one of your legs is the one giving you all the money. So in this case, you'll see property taxes are going up, but you're getting out of balance. And you suddenly need more money from your other legs in order to balance. So here we have the state funding. So if the state funding gives us enough money, we're a little bit in balance, we're not doing too bad, um, but if they go up by 4% for expenses and we have property taxes only go up by 4 and tuition by 4, we need state funding to be by 4 as well. So um, what you're looking for here is the combined 4% as you see at the bottom where we have a 4, 4, and 4, so this is like the kind of the perfect world scenario, but this is really what we try to educate the board and others on, on being able to to look at all those different revenue sources and be able to keep ourselves balanced to the expenses. Um, if you can't keep these, these revenues up, you'll end up having to lower your expenses. So that's where you see budget reductions. So that's just kind of a, a quick visual way to look at how we're funded as a community college. Um, here's our tuition and fees. Um, one thing that the board voted for this year was only a $3. Um, as you saw, expenses are going up more than 3%, but the board only raised tuition by $3. Uh, most of the peer colleges out there raised it from an average around 7% for the other 16 colleges, so we were well below the state's average of raised tuition this year. Um, so one thing that happened with us is we actually now have become the lowest tuition in the Portland metro area. Um, and we're also the second lowest in the entire state at this point for tuition for entering students. And as you see, um, here we are on the spread. Tuition has gone up quite a bit from 3,500 to 5,000 in the last 10 years because of the lack of state funding that we've had. We've had to really raise tuition aggressively to keep up with the pace. This is the same graph, it's just much flatter. And the reason um, I think we put this is to show that community colleges, which is this cluster here, are still a very affordable um, uh, cost for students. As you see here, um, Portland State University, OIT, are around that nine to 10,000 range, and of course the big four years like OSU and University of Oregon are around 14 to 15,000 a year. So um, community colleges is still affordable tuition and fees for students. Here's a complicated graph, it's essentially the um, light colored bars are the state's discretionary revenue. So that's how much money the state in Salem has been getting for revenues for state ta um, income taxes and, and their revenue sources, business taxes. The red bars are the amount of that that they're allocating for community colleges. So um, the blue line is to help see it as a ratio. So basically, 
we're showing that 4% back in the, about 20 years ago, about 4.1% of the state's general fund budget went to fund community colleges in Oregon. At this point, we're all the way down to 2.9%. So we are um, way below where we were 20 years ago as far as being funded as a proportional amount of the state's budget. Um, as you see, that state growth is 109% over those 20 years, and they've given uh, the community colleges a 50% increase in that same time. <clears throat> this is the one that's always kind of shocking to think about, but at 4.1% right now, that would be an allocation of $791 million. And so anybody who's following, um, we got 570 in the last biennium. Right now we budgeted at 590 and the, the HEC, so the Higher Education um, Commission, is looking and requesting that community colleges get 647. So the 647 is still the good number that we're all hoping to get. And it's nowhere even near what we would have been getting had we been getting a proportional amount of that state budget. Here's our full-time equivalent FTE for students. So student enrollment is down. As you see, um, we stayed around the 7,000, mid-7,000s up to 8,000 back in the, um, right after the turn of the century. Then we had the Great Recession right about here. And as you see, we've anecdotally talked about it. We got near 9,000 FTE at the college during that period in the peak. And then post-recession, it went back down. And we started tapering off right around the 7,000s again. Um, what's changed now is um, here dramatically in the last 24 months, so it's just the last two years, I'm going to call it 23 because we have about one month left in this fiscal year, but so far between last fiscal year and this fiscal year, or academic year, we've gone from 7,000 down to 6,200, so we've dropped 9% over the course of just the last two academic years here. So that's a huge drop for us. So, so that kind of tracks the uh, unemployment rate. It is very um, cyclical to unemployment, and so you can definitely think if we are like at record amounts of um, low unemployment, the 62, I think the last, went back into the books, and I think I had to go back into the early 90s till we were at 6,000 students, so, or 6,000 FTE. So shows that we have to go all the way back almost 30 years to get the same amount of students that we have right now. Um, so it's definitely a low enrollment period for us. Um, this one's a little busy. Um, I'll try to highlight what the story is telling. The story it's telling is from 2014 through 2017, in these three bar graphs over here, the light colors are the other 16 community colleges drops post-recession. So the other 16 community colleges dropped a combined 17% enrollment. So that's how much enrollment over a three-year span that our 16 peer colleges dropped. During that same period, CCC only dropped 3%. So we had a very steady um, enrollment period. Even though we were dropping, we were very steady compared to our peers during the same three years. Um, and then the last two years, where I just talked about, we've had a steep 9% drop. Um, they're starting to plateau a little bit, um, not quite drop as steeply. And so we're actually now losing ground on our peer colleges in the last two years. So it's just something we're watching because the state formula is also based on um, your, you comp your FTE of students compared to your peer colleges. So even though we're dropping, um, everybody's dropping, but if we drop faster than our peers, we get a smaller piece of the pie out of the Salem. So. Or do they balance that out? So if we drop more than the ones that didn't drop as much, no, do we? No, it's not the way it, dro that's not the way it balances out. It's my next slide, I'll show you how it balances out, but it does not, it's based on students. So as, as you get fewer students, you're getting less state funding. So their state funding, same as the K-12 model for um, public you know, uh, school, is it's based on students. So it's not trying to give people more money that are getting fewer students. It's trying to give fewer, less money to the people who have fewer students because you just don't need as many teachers is the, is the theory there. So um, the equalization formula, which I will talk about in a second, I'll tell you what they do. So one of, one of the things before Jeff mentions that is we have the benefit, so even though we're dropping at a higher percentage than our peers. Um, we have almost like a little grace period because there is this three-year rolling average that occurs in the state formula. So we, we're still benefiting from that a little bit, but those times are about to change. Yeah, yeah and you'll see that in the forecast. I can even point it out when we get there, but this, um, you really don't start seeing this until you get to the third year of it, and then you've got a three-year rolling average of, of outpacing your peers. 
And then you get to about here and here, which is really about where we're at today. We are getting outpaced by our peers, but we still had good years out here where we were kind of offsetting. So that three-year average is kind of starting to tilt. It's a little misleading. Um, but what happens is you start looking into the future years when you, you forecast that we're going to be all the same. Yeah. So assuming everything stays the same, these all start rolling off, and then these start becoming the three-year average. So you actually see where it looks bad is like year 2022 and years out there. So that's, mm -hmm. that is one yeah. of the things that hits the forecast in the outer years is that that catches up. Um, here's our um, equalization formula. So this is what the state pretty much does is they say, um, let's see how much you've collected in property tax. And if you Clackamas County are getting a lot of growth in Happy Valley and Damascus and you're, you're just burning through 5% increase in property taxes, but Baker and, and other areas of Eastern Oregon are only getting like 2% because they don't have a lot of growth. They take our money out of the state funding and give it to those peer colleges. So it's actually the opposite of what you just talked about. When we lose enrollment, that's a one-to-one -one relationship with their money. Where they do an equalization is to try to help out their peer colleges that don't have your property tax revenue. So that's really what they're doing there. And the tricky part about that is um, they uh, essentially, if the state funding gives you a certain amount and you have property taxes of a certain amount, um, those two kind of offset each other because they're looking at your property taxes. So whatever you have out there is your public resources. Um, you then have your tuition, and all of that is based on your FTE because tuition, by its very nature, is a one-to-one -one relationship with as you have more enrollment, you have higher tuition. And as Jeff mentioned before, you know our, our property taxes are going up by about 4.5%. So that's not insignificant, you know, and so it does have real impacts on us if we have this kind of, there aren't any losers in the system. So it does, it does adversely affect us. So there's been a lot of conversation over the years about the equalization formula and should it be revisited. And how is that, how would that be revisited and who would be the players in that market? The champions. I mean, it would have to be all the community colleges coming together, you know, whether it's through the Higher Education Coordinating Commission or OCCA, Oregon Community College Association. Um, it would have to be a collaborative effort because we, we, all, um, we all use that formula right now. So we'd all have to be part of that conversation. So it's the higher, the higher ed community that has to make that decision as to how they're, if they would modify that formula. I think that the, it would be smart to have that recommendation come from that body, that group with a lot of engagement, yeah. I will say, you know, at the business officers meeting that Alyssa and I are part of, uh, which are mainly, you know, the head finance people, we all talk about it, but then it's an interesting conversation because you're all, you really don't want to be, it's almost like being a bunch of siblings trying to talk about estate planning and who's going to get mom's money or whatever, right, or, you know, parents' money. Because you really don't want to do something that, that says, do you realize my property taxes are paying for you all? You know, you don't really want to have that conversation. Um, but you do want to have something that makes sense. Um, so it is a, an interesting where something has to almost come from the independent, so to speak, um, OCCA or HEC or somebody at the higher level or, you know, legislatively. Well, yeah, because it goes back to Measure 5 in the 90s when we yeah. changed all of the whole property tax funding of yeah. education yeah. Yeah. statewide yeah. Yeah. by Measure 5. And it's all been a formulation since then and has the formulation kept up with the reality? Yeah, and that's, that's that is the question. The struggle. Really, the formulation we, hasn't kept up with the reality. It hasn't. So who has to change the formula is the current question. Yeah, yeah and I think the part that's gonna be really challenging um, is that we have this history of you know, winners and no losers, and so it would be, it is gonna be challenging if that, when, when, that, when that conversation takes place. And um, at this point in time, I don't have any meetings on my calendar to have that conversation, so I don't really know that there's a ton of push behind it at the moment. Well, it's partly because nobody knows who to have the conversation with. Yeah. So the problem is the conversation needs to be had, but who has to start that conversation and who's willing to start that conversation yeah, it's good feedback. I think the presidents um, really have to drive a lot of that, and with the the heck and the you know to start having those discussions with legislators and their boards, you know, to all have those. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it came from the legislators or where it came from. Yeah, I mean, I think the legislators have the most pull in changing. Obviously, um, I think, from my understanding, a lot of the formula looks at property taxes in a in a way that isn't quite fair from what the state 
figures as your CSL, you know, which is your current service levels. So to me, I think there needs to be that there needs to be that push from HEC and OCCA to the legislators to fix some of that well, language. Well, it's just our conversation. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem. Is because I don't think there's been conversations saying, let's realize that Measure Five did this. We're 30 years into you know Measure mm -hmm. Five. Is the reality still the same as when Measure Five went in? Yeah. yeah. Good point. You make a good point. So the, we're going to get into the forecast side. So the forecast side, um, here's some of the assumptions that go into the forecast. The state funding, we'll see two versions of this forecast. So one version will be what we did our proposed budget at, which is the 590, all 17 or maybe 16 of the 17 colleges decided to, um, just so they could have a budgeting process that had a real number to it, use 590 as, a, as the allocation for community colleges. 647, as I mentioned, was the um, 647 million being the, the good case scenario that the heck was trying to get. Um, so we will see a version of that. Um, the board has already increased tuition by $3 and didn't change fees. Um, enrollment um, is projected to drop 4%. I think we're currently at 4.2 through halfway through spring term here. So year to date is about 4% drop. So then we take the 4% and move that number forward for the whole forecast and say we're gonna stay flat after that. And then property taxes have been right around 4.5% growth, um, so we stick with that. And then we maintain that 10% ending fund balance as a best practice policy, and then we balance to that. I just wanna kinda of underscore that bullet that talks about the enrollment drop of 4% and the fact that in our forecast, we actually, after that drop, we do forecast flat going forward, which is a little bit of a delicate dance because as you know, we're seeing drops in consecutive years. And so um, Jeff and I have a lot of conversation about do we need to adjust that? Is flat the way we wanna go? Historically, that's how the college has forecasted enrollment, relatively flat. That can come back to create challenges because as you know, 98% of our funding is based on enrollment. So, um, so it's something that we are mindful of and um, while we try to be somewhat conservative, but also you know, just very fiscally responsible, we build the forecast, it is an area that could leave us a little anxiety because we've seen drops um, in sequential years. So I just mentioned that. Uh, on the expenditure side, uh, we have a small increase for pay equity legislation. We haven't finished that project yet, but we put a placeholder in place in case there were impacts from pay equity. Um, uh, cost of living increased the materials and services of 2%. And then we updated the PERS rates. PERS rates, which there's a couple slides later on PERS with, um, we'll talk about. And that went up from about 14.5% to 18.1% for the next biennium. So we've, we've uh, you'll see it in a second here, but we've, um, that's a steep, this is one of the steepest increases in PERS that we've had so far for some time. Um, and then we are continuing the cash transfers that we've been doing, which were an innovation fund, an equipment fund, and a major maintenance fund. So we've just put some good policies in place for having those through good asset management and good processes to, to allocate those funds. So we're currently budgeting to maintain those status quo. So here's the forecast. You might have to zoom the, uh, the camera in to, to get that. And I'm not sure how well you guys can see it. I'll, I'll focus you to a couple pieces. So one is the red row of numbers here is our operating surplus or deficit. So um, that's really saying how much are we collecting in revenues annually compared to what our expenses are annually. And the, the negative numbers show that we were, you know, as of last fiscal year, in a, operating in slightly a $1.3 million deficit, but we had reserves. So it wasn't a really hitting us too deeply last fiscal year. This year we're on pace to be, um, most of that is actually, this uh, is like tuition drops and other things like that that we've had in the current year. So we're actually outpacing last year's deficit and we're at about a pace for a $2 million deficit, again, used burning into some of our reserves that we've had out there. Um, as you see next year and next biennium is like a four to $5 million annual deficit at the $590 million rate. So that's, again, when you have increased expenses, you only raise tuition by $3, your property taxes are set with Measure 5, Measure 50, so you're not gonna get a ton of property taxes, um, and you're pretty much set with what that 590 is, which is only a couple percent of extra funding by the state, 
you're left with a huge operating deficit that you have to deal with. And Jeff will show you this later, but our biggest component of our budget is personnel. So it's 76%. And so when PERS is going up by 4%, and then he hasn't shown you the slide yet, but the year after that, it's going to go up by 6%, potentially, um, without new legislation to kind of curtail that. Uh, that's a huge impact on that operating deficit. So here you'll see one of the key things to look at is this $5.3 million, $5 million deficit. Um, that's kind of compounded because it basically saying we're going to balance next year's budget. So we, we, it's coming up here in a couple of weeks. We have to balance an adopted budget based on being underfunded. Um, and if we do that, we'll have to use $1.2 million of our $3 million PERS reserve. And then that would show that we'd still have a gap that we'd be having to deal with in the next year of 5.3 million. So that's, again, um, it's amplified because it's not a two year cycle that you're spreading out, you're doing it all in one year like that. So that is uh, um, one of the challenges at only getting 590 that, we've, that you've heard a lot of angst about. Um, and then this shows us using the other 1.7 million of the PERS reserves in the next biennium. Um, but again, this is the unknown of out there when you start having other impacts to PERS. We have that three-year rolling of state funding being lower than what we've been getting. Um, and we start running out of reserves, so this quickly gets into the red, um, depending on, and unknown of what the next biennium's uh, state. Again, this is assuming a state allocation of only 590 for the next biennium, which would be um, pretty much catastrophic at that point. And that, so that we don't have any other PERS reserves than that that remaining 1.7 that you see if there's the last of it. So even if there are more years shown on this forecast, that, that's the last of the PERS reserves that the college had set aside. Right. Yeah. All right. So the good news, if you get 647, um, 647, we're in a much smaller operating deficit, but it's still um, really not the, the enrollment trend. In fact, this would have been in the positive. You see this total is a minus 1.7 million over the course of the two-year biennium. Um, and it probably would have been in the positive if we hadn't had 4% enrollment drop this year. Because um, we, were, we were probably in a good shape to have a 4% one year, but the, the cumulative between the two of them are really what pushed that into a negative number now. Um, but even at that, that's still not using any of the PERS reserves. So that's leaving the whole 3 million of PERS reserves untouched and keeping all the other current allocations of $3, $3 tuition increases annually, um, so so it, it's a better spot to be, even though it's 1.7 million deficit a year from now, it's still uh, not using up a lot of the other reserves. I think the key takeaway on this slide is that while 647 would be great, we really do need to be at that 790. So you remember that slide that showed where we would be at? Um, you, 647 sounds like a huge number, right, statewide? Mm -hmm. But, you know, look at the last two columns on that spreadsheet. Yeah. And short of it's still um, short of enrollment increasing clip. back and um, a good allocation in the next biennium, which we again we'll talk about some other issues. At least for the short term, um, it's a smaller issue, but it still doesn't mean we're swimming in a bunch of money. Is really what uh, that comes out with. So here's just a, a reminder. This is sort of like the, the three-legged stool that I started with, which is tuition, property taxes, and state um, funding are three of the primary resources we work with, the other one being our fund balance that we have out there, which is our reserve, um, the 10% plus any other um, reserves that we have out there. So that's pretty much our total general fund resources that we work with annually. And they pay for, as Alyssa said, three quarters of our expenses, our personnel. Um, and then we have our, basically our materials and services are the rest of the, the other stuff, except for a little bit of capital a little bit of transfers out to those major maintenance and innovation and equipment funds. And then some contingency is pretty much that reserve that with some contingency we have in those reserves. And here's the general fund by function. These are the different types of things that we use that same 66 million on, which primarily is instruction. 41% is um, direct classroom instruction. We have instructional support, college support, um, student services, um, and then here's that contingency, 8% and transfers out at 8%. So those are what we spend the money on as from a functional standpoint. Do you guys have any questions about Yeah, after those we got through, pies? that's most of the nuts and bolts of the numbers. Are there any questions on those? Okay. You wanna Keep moving along. talk about yeah. the other funds? 
So kind of the primary other fund that you're going to be thinking about probably is the bond fund. But and when we talk about transfers out and funds that we set aside, we do have annual cash transfers that occur. So um, Jeff already mentioned these, but we have the innovation fund, the equipment fund, and major maintenance funds. And so those are annual allocations. We do have processes and groups that get together and evaluate projects each year, score them, rank them, and allocate those funds. So major maintenance, you know, as part of an asset management program, this is critical. We have a lot of deferred maintenance on our campus. We've tried to use some of the bond funds to help us get over the hump in terms of repairing some of our buildings. Um, but I don't know if any allocation would ever be enough. And deferring the maintenance ends up costing t sometimes 10 times what it would cost if you did it when it's, when it's due. Um, so those are some of our funds. Other funds for the bond program, as you know, we're in a bond building right now. Other projects that are going to be completed soon, we have the Desjardin Science Building, which can, is going to be done this fall and open up. I was just in it the other day. It looks beautiful. Um, automotive is happening right now in Barlow Hall, so it's kind of a construction zone over there right now. And um, seismic improvements at Randall. We just got the bids in on that project. Um, that one is going to be leveraging a grant of $1.5 million, so it's a great seismic grant that we were able to get. Repaving the remaining portion of Douglas Loop. So that'll happen in a couple consecutive phases, so that'll be happening soon. We have that out to get bids right now. We haven't received bids back, but that's in progress. And then the new student services building. So this is kind of the last big building that we have on the plan. It's targeted for around 20 million. We probably will not have cost estimates until the end of this month, um, which is just around the corner. And we've been doing a lot of value engineering on that project to try to figure out how can we get that budget number down. So it's really tough being the last project in a bond program. So future considerations, some of these go without saying. When we look at the forecast and you know what's happening next, we're always paying attention to the federal picture and how is that going to impact our budget. Are there going to be mandates that come down? What's happening at the state level? Of course, that's something we talk about pretty much every day because we keep thinking we're going to get the, the support fund number and then it's like, okay, now it's next week and then that week goes by and then now it's the next week. and so. We're always paying attention to that. Looking at enrollment, we work closely with our data group on you know, what are the enrollment numbers and comparing that to, to prior terms and prior years. Technology, of course, has a huge impact. It tends to have an escalation of about 8%, which is typically more than most M&S expenditures. So we're always looking at what are the costs for technology and how do we make sure that infrastructure you know, is new and fresh and relevant and helps us do our jobs. And of course, PERS. I feel like we talk a lot about PERS, but there is legislation on the table right now that we're all looking into. They're looking at re-amortizing the PERS UAL, unfunded actuarial liability, and if they were to extend the terms on that, um, it could improve our PERS rates. It wouldn't happen until the next biennium. The numbers that, that I've seen show that it could impact our rates by as much as 4%, so that could be really good for us. Uh, so we're kind of waiting to see if that goes through. It's kind of being processed at the state right now. There are some other things in that PERS bill that impact you all as employees, so if you're close to retirement or even if you're not, it's probably good for you to check into the PERS bill and see how it might impact you personally because there are some changes in there. And then um, I want to just share a little bit of data. There are three slides that um, all the community colleges in Oregon uh, provided information to the HEC regarding our ratios for students and either administrators or different bargaining units. And so this one shows for administration. We're right up here at 172 students per administrator. And he, these are all the other community colleges in Oregon. So we run really lean. We've been really lean for a long time. In fact, in years where we potentially could have bloated a little bit, that's where we created the PERS reserve. So I think the college was really smart, you know, in, in years before I was here, where they set aside money in good years and were fiscally responsible. And this one shows for classified staff, we're 36 students to one classified staff. So we're really running lean here too. The average is 29, we're at 36. And then full-time faculty equivalent, so this was kind of a merge of full-time, part-time. We're at 26, and the average over here is 24. Again, incredibly lean compared to our peers in Oregon. So y'all are doing great work with not a lot of resources, so keep that in mind. I think our hearts are all in the right places. Purse costs, I'm just going to talk about it, but remember when I said it goes up by four and then six? This is that scary number. 
So we're really kind of hoping that that legislation will improve our rates. But I'm going to let Jeff talk through this, right? Were you interested in this? Yeah, it's okay. only the last two slides, yeah. so we'll just quickly, uh, as we've already kind of talked about first. So that's the, the big hit is next biennium. Um, as Alyssa said, the legislation would mainly pretty much put us with, we took that big hit here in the current biennium that we talked about earlier, um, and the, the legislation that's going through would almost get us to where next biennium would be knocked off four to five percent, which would get us close to where we are just got moved up to. So it's still, it's not really solving the problem, it's just keeping the next biennium a little bit easier to handle. Um, and the primary piece to take away, I think, is the red line. The red line is like a three-year rolling average trend line or maybe five-year rolling out uh, trend line of the rates. The rates bounce up and down a lot. It's hard to keep track of what they really are because they bounced around so much with reform and other things that have happened um, since the 90s here. As you see, this goes all the way back to 95. Um, but you'll notice that kind of as a trend line, it stays around 5 to 10 percent. So rates have been somewhere around 5 to 10 percent when you average it out over the life of a long tenure of time. Um, but now they would be spiking up from, as you see, all these 8, 10s, 9s, to an 18 and then a 24. So it just is a, a massive spike of, um, of percentage of payrolls going down to Salem. So you get no extra service for it. You get nothing else. The students are getting one more um, thing of service for that extra money of expense that we have to pay. So it's a really difficult thing to, to deal with when you have to have an increased expense with nothing associated with that expense other than taking care of the problem that this is the problem. Um, and I want to say it's anyone's fault, but really the, the issue is um, really the retirees and inactives make up 70% of where those dollars are going to pay for. So it's the people that have already retired, um, people from the 90s and early 2000s, when the system was pretty much broken on the formula, um, that the system counts on getting at least 7.2% earnings every year on the stock market in order to pay for all those 70% of the retirees and inactive people out there. So when you take those two things, uh, it's not about the money that they're getting in Salem, it's about getting the good re investment earnings year over year over year on a group that really three quarters of them are not working anymore. So it's not the people here, the tier one, tier two um, people even today working. It's really a lot of the problem is still the people that are out there. So it just shows that, um, again, I don't want to point to the retirees, but just to say that is the structural piece that everybody has an issue with because when you try to figure out a way to put less money in the hands of the people that are already retired, just is going to go to um, uh, the judges and get overturned. So that was already happened once. And the PERS legislation that's on the table right now is trying to incentivize people who are inactive to go ahead and separate from PERS because they do carry a, a huge cost. And so if you go and read the bill, there is some language in there that might prompt them to want to separate. And I think what PERS is trying to do is, in a way, cut their losses. So get them out of the system sooner than later so that they're a lesser impact going forward. Same thing they're doing right now with existing employees who are tier one or two, tier two and ready and eligible to retire. If they can get them to separate from the system now that are going to have lower long-term costs on the PERS system. So if you read that bill, you'll see they're, they're trying to incentivize people to separate now from PERS. So we take a what could possibly incentivize people to to leave? get themselves there, out there, of a there good are deal? Some, yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there, there are, are some things yeah. in there. You know, that um, one of them they're allowing employees if they separate from a PERS employer to remain a full time employee with that employer for up to until January first of twenty twenty. Um, they have language in the bill about your IAP individualized account program and a percentage of that. Um, being diverted to a different account, and there's you know not a huge impact, but there's an impact to that capping final average salary. So there are a number of things that they've included in the bill that might incentivize people to go ahead and, and separate. And um, so I think what they're trying to do is get that kind of yellow stripes to kind of go away, number one, and then just to reduce the long-term costs for the entire PERS program. So. So there's not a lot of relief in the near future, um, because it's even if it, it doesn't end until what 2035. 2035 when a lot of, is about when when a lot of the retirees from the 90s, early 2000s are 
projected to no longer be collecting annual or monthly payments. It doesn't mean it's going <laughs> up. It doesn't mean it's going up until then. It just means we have a few more years before we actually plateau, and then we carry out that rate until we get to about 2020, 34, 35, and, and then it will start to slowly decline. You guys all know what happens in those years, but I'm not gonna say it for you. So. Um, what is an inactive? So an inactive would be, the famous one is the, the, the athletic director for, um, was it for University of Oregon? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's an, so there's, they were PERS eligible, making a million dollars a year as a, or whatever he made. Um, so he was considered, that's considered his retirement pay for when he retires, but he's not retired. So he's an inactive employee. He was eligible, vested in PERS for that million dollar a year PERS retirement payment. But if you're not, you know, 65 and haven't put in your paperwork work with PERS and have collected it, you're considered an inactive employee. So it's really people that have been working for um, a public agency and then left and are now not retired fully yet, but they're doing something with a private sector or something like that, waiting for their time to put their, their name in the hat for PERS so they can actually retire. And part of it, Amanda, for those folks who are inactive, they might still be eligible for a program called Money Match. Which, is, which ends up creating a higher um, annual benefit when you retire. And so I believe the legislation might also be tweaking money match um, language. So that actually might encourage more inactives to separate sooner than later. But again, any of the PERS stuff has to be prospective going forward. And so I know they have had a lot of attorneys looking at it to make sure that it would hold up in court. So that's been um, a huge part of their work is to make sure that the legality issues are addressed. Any other questions? That was the end of the yeah. regular slideshow. We're at slideshow. our crossroads so of questions and answers. To, uh, answer any other questions? This may be very simplistic. Of course it is. <laughs> it looks like we're going to have to develop some strategies to deal with the unknowns coming down the pike two or three, four years down the road. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've had very, uh, you know, light conversation about um, the fact that we need to develop a process and, but we don't know what that's going to look like yet. Part of what we we're trying to do was hold out for the state number to see, you know, how bad might it be before we go ahead and create something. We have looked to our peer community colleges and started asking them, you know, what process did you use? How did you identify cuts? I mean, I think that, um, it's a tough conversation to have. So I don't, not that we're procrastinating, but we know we're probably gonna have to have it, but we wanna wait and see what our numbers are gonna be because there is quite a spread between 590 and 647. So it changes the conversation a little bit. But if you know state funding doesn't increase drastically even after this biennium, then um, we could be looking at even you know larger cuts. So you know there's lots of different schools of thoughts about how you address cuts, um, but we really haven't gotten there yet. Well, I saw your uh email about an incentive to retire early type thing. So I'm assuming somebody in HR said, okay, here's all the employees, here's all the old ones. Let's no, go. actually that, that incentive was just so people would notify us earlier for planning purposes, for doing the outreach and the recruitment in terms of timing. So one of the things that we're aware of is that there's like kind of a key time of year when you hire in particular for faculty positions. And so we were trying to incentivize people just to let us know sooner so that we could do that pre-planning so that we're hitting the open market at the at the sweet spot so we can get good candidates. So it really isn't your, it's not a traditional retirement incentive program to encourage people to retire. It's, it's not that. And um, we didn't do number crunching like you're suggesting to do that. We just were trying to get information sooner for people who were planning to leave um, it doesn't mean that the college wouldn't look at doing a future, you know, retirement incentive program. I did include that language in my in my email. You know, that could be something we do look at as part of a process. We also could look at, you know, holding positions vacant longer. I mean, there's a number of things that that we could do. Yeah, I mean, if you move your break, you know, it's break even point back. So, like, if it's 76 percent of your total budget is personnel costs, and so if that dropped to 72 percent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have a definite impact. Yeah. yeah. Shifts the burden over the Yeah. Yeah, those are the discussions mm -hmm. we'll have to have if certainly in the outer years if we don't have any relief out there for the revenues. So Jeff and I have both been through cut processes at organizations and uh, it's it's never enjoyable. 
yeah, and if you were here, you were part of them here, because that's, that's happened in the past. Other questions? Good presentation. Thank you. You guys can feel free to shoot us an email if you think of something later and if burning questions and want to know, feel free to reach out to us. You know how to find us in Outlook. And the presentation is on our um, business office intranet website. So the one that through the MyClackamas were uh, under the forecast, PowerPoint. the PowerPoint is going to be there. So um, anybody, it's, there. it's actually, Perfect. yeah, I think it went up yesterday. Yes, so. And for those of you on your computer, thanks for watching. Yeah. <laughs> that one slide you have about state revenues, I mean, everybody's talking about the state's got a lot of money and mm -hmm. you know, it's more, and then our percentage of allocation. Mm -hmm. um, I know we've all talked to our legislative people about that, and we use that, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. That slide. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I mean, we and, have and been I, for and, years. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they all support us, yeah. but nobody. It really makes it sink in. I did do one. I left it out for this group, but I did do one for the budget committee, which is more of the you know um, public facing group that goes to our budget committees, um, our public budget committee. I did do one there that showed the K-12 um, trend as well. So where K-12 was funded as a percentage of the state's budget 20 years ago and we, where K-12 is now and where you saw we'd got 50% out of the 100, they'd gotten 78 or some, 70 something. So right in about the middle. So it shows that we're actually being funded, what you call, I guess, disinvestment. The yeah. disinvestment of, of community colleges has happened at a faster disinvestment pace than K-12. So uh, again, that's the message. It's a message that I think we focus a lot publicly, um, as you see in the newspaper articles and things about the K-12, but it, it's happening with us. And of course, the, the Oregonian article that came out that said, um, the, I can't remember her name, Smith Warner or whatever her name was that said, but community colleges can just raise their tuition and K-12 can't. Um, that's really not thinking it through the student lens, right? I mean, would you really want to do that to your 18-year-old to say, I'm going to put it on your back, you know, because you, we didn't want to give that state funding. So to me, that was like really telling, you know, that's kind of a disconnection from that disinvestment. But. And if you wanted to see the budget committee presentation, which was a little bit longer than this one, it is available in the board docs. So if you wanted to see more numbers, and more pie charts and tables, it is available to you. And we can actually, we'll make sure the links to this presentation and to the board documents are included in the video. And then the video is gonna be shared with all staff too. So thanks for coming. Thanks for watching. All right. All right. Thanks you guys. Thank you.